before we start such an important and informative seminar, I would request one and all to kindly put your mobile phones on silent mode or switch it off. I repeat, to avoid any kind of disturbances, please switch off your mobile or put it on silent mode. Thank you. Honorable Minister, Shri Mangubai Patel, our Honorable Minister, Shri Bachubai Khabar, our Honorable Minister, Mrs. Rajashri Birla, welcome, ma'am, Mr. Morgans Jensen, Dr. Kelly Leach, Mr. Wes Decord, Dr. Mukund Rajan, Ms. Aya Hitavua, Mr. Giriandre Bihari, we welcome all the dignitaries. Thank you for gracing our event. We appreciate that. I would request the audience to please join me with a big round of applause, giving our esteemed guests the best of cordial welcome with pride and honor. Thank you very much, all of you. We are waiting for the arrival of Sri Arun Jaitli, sir, the Union Finance Minister, Government of India. We are thankful to all the dignitaries for being here. We are expecting the arrival of Sri Arun Jaitley, sir, in any moment. Much for attending. The schedule. The meeting between. Respected audience, I would again request to keep your phones on the silent mode, please, to avoid any kind of disturbances between the seminar.
please please welcome our union finance minister shri arun jaitli sir we are highly grateful for your august presence sir we welcome you sir Thank you very much, all the dignitaries. We start with the program from now. I would, with pride, welcome and introduce Sri Saurabhai Patel, Honorable Minister for Planning, Finance, Energy, and Petrochemicals, Government of Gujarat. Sri Saurabhai Patel has served Gujarat with the important portfolios during his political career. Under his dynamic leadership, Gujarat has developed leaps and bounds with social responsibilities always a the priority. I would request Sri Saurabh Bhai to kindly give the welcome address and introductory remarks. Over to you, sir. Hello. The Honorable Union Finance Minister, Sri Arun Jitli Ji, my colleague, Honorable Minister, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to welcome you all to the theme seminar, CSR, Touching Lives and Making an Impact, as part of the Vibrant Gujarat Global Investor Summit 2015. It is in the matter of great pleasure that the Honorable Union Finance Minister, Sri Arun Jitli Ji, has kindly consented to grace the seminar and address us. Sri Jaitli Ji is not only carry forward the onerous task of bringing the Indian economy back on rails, but also holds the responsibility of the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. It is in this capacity we welcome his presence and look forward to his views on corporate social responsibility. We are extremely honored to have with us Mr. Mojan Jensen, Honorable Minister from Denmark, and Dr. Kelly Leach, Honorable Minister, Canada, both of whom are representing as our partner countries. We look forward to learning from the experience in your countries on the contribution of corporate to social well-being. It is also a great honor for us to have with us very senior representatives of Indian corporate sector. I especially extend a warm welcome to Mati Rajesh Shibilla, as also to Sri Mukun J. Rajan of the Tata Group. We are privileged to have the international experience in CSR represented by the International Committee of Red Cross, UNICEF, and the Gates Foundation here today. I extend a warm welcome to you. The Government of India has amended the Companies Act in 2013 to mandate CSR spending by companies achieving a certain prescribed level of net profit, turnover, or net worth. Gujarat has already put in place an institutional framework to leverage this important resource by setting up a CSR advisory board under the chairmanship of Honorable Chief Minister and the CSR authority, which would coordinate the efforts of both the private and the public sector companies so as to optimize the outcomes of CSR initiatives in Gujarat. Gujarat State Public Sector Units have been making a significant contribution in the past in various community initiatives as part of good corporate governance practices. This activity is largely focused on child nutrition, elementary education, drinking water supply in the villages, tree plantation, and environment awareness campaign. Friends, while no doubt the spending on CSR has become mandatory, and there will be many of you who would like to contribute to the society with their funds. At the same time, the government of Gujarat also values the managerial and technical expertise that you would bring to these programs, which would add much more value to the money that is spent. While Gujarat is already focused on social sector initiatives and spends over 40% of the plan on these sectors, yet we also look forward to the significant contribution from the corporate world 
in the new agenda for nation building which includes the Mahatma Gandhi Swachh Mission. We also have a galaxy of eminent subject speakers and practitioners in the panel discussion that follows. I welcome them all. I welcome our honored guest and all the panelists once again with this few words. I wish all delegates the full benefit of very educative and thought-provoking discussion during the course of the seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for the welcome note and the glimpse of future work as well. We appreciate the presence of August dignitaries in this event, and hence we would like to present the fruit baskets as the welcome note. I would request the esteemed guests to kindly accept the same. For that, I would request Sri Jayan Singh, Additional Chief Secretary, Finance Department, to kindly welcome our Union Minister, Sri Arun Jaitli, sir, with fruit basket. Thank you, gentlemen. I would call upon Mr. M. Sahu, Chairman, CSR Authority, to welcome our Honorable Minister, Sri Saurabhai Patel. Thank you, sir. I would request Sri R. C. Rawal, Director of Primary Education, to welcome Sri Mangubhai Patel, our Honorable Minister. I would now call upon Mr. Jasmine Gandhi, MD, Gujarat Thakur Development Corporation Limited, to welcome Sri Bachubai Khabar, our Honorable Minister. Sorry, sir is not here with us, but we welcome, uh, welcome him in the seminar. Next is, I would now request Mr. Murli Krishna, Managing Director, Gujarat Urban Development Company, to welcome Mr. Morgans Jensen from Denmark. Thank you very much. I would now call upon, on dais, Mr. Anupam Anand, CEO, Gujarat Municipal Finance Board, to welcome Mrs. Rajashree Birla from Aditya Birla Foundation. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Now I request Mr. Pankaj Joshi, Development Commissioner, to welcome Dr. Kelly Litch from Canada. Thank you. I would request Mr. Anish Makar, Director, Technical Education, to please welcome Mr. Wes Decord, ICRC. Thank you very much. I would like to call upon Sri Mukesh Kumar, State Project Director, Sarva Shikshan Abhyan, to please welcome Dr. Mukund Rajan from Tata. I would call upon Mrs. Momita Dastedar, Communications Officer, UNICEF, Gujarat, to kindly welcome Ms. Aya Hitawa from UNICEF. Thank you very much, ma'am. I would request Sri A.J. Shah, Managing Director, Gujarat Livelihood Promotion Company Limited, to please welcome Mr. Giriandra Bihari from Gates Foundation. Thank you very much, sir. We welcome Sri Janti Bhai Kavaria, our Honorable Minister, and request Dr. V. Thirupugal, Commissioner and Secretary, Rural Development, to kindly welcome him. Thank you very much. A round of applause for all the dignitaries over here. Thank you. I would take the proceedings of the seminar. I would now request Dr. Kelly Lidge. With due respect and warmth, I would like to welcome and introduce before all of you Dr. Kelly Lidge, Honorable Minister of Labor and States of Women, Government of Canada. Dr. Lidge has been actively working for the issues affecting Canadian children and youth. She's an orthopedic pediatric surgeon and has associations with lots of organization. I would request Dr. Kelly to kindly share her views regarding the seminar before us. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Namaste. And thank you uh, for having me here in India. This is my first trip to your country, and delighted to be here. On behalf of Canada's Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, and the Government of Canada, I'm honored to be here to speak to you about Canada's approach to, so, to corporate social responsibility. 
Our government has been focused on job creation, economic growth, and long-term prosperity. And promoting sustainable economic growth at home and abroad are key elements of our prosperity agenda. Sustainable economic growth must be based on both strong and transparent government policies that encourage socially responsible business practices. While the economy is our number one priority, we must ensure that the fundamental rights of workers are respected and that vulnerable individuals in <laughs> I hope you're all awake now. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna continue. But in particular, that vulnerable individuals, in particular in my case, I very much focus on women and girls, um, as well as children, uh, must be attended to. Uh, I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon in Canada. I practice part-time, as well as being a minister in our cabinet. And I have to say that the one thing and the one group of individuals that we all have a responsibility to look out for are our children. And uh, the issue with respect to child labor, issues around forced child labor, or particularly putting children in harm's way, particularly with dangerous work, is something that I take very seriously. And I encourage all other leaders, individuals that are members of cabinets, individuals that are leaders of government, to take it extremely seriously. Children should never be put in harm's way. When I talk about prosperity, I'm not just talking about economic prosperity. I'm talking about the right of every individual, men and women, to be treated fairly and given equal opportunities to succeed. That includes the right to refuse dangerous work and having safety in their workplace so that they can be productive. And businesses have a key role in providing these opportunities. Canada has a long-standing commitment to corporate social responsibility which we define as the voluntary activities undertaken by a company over and above legal requirements to operate in an economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable manner. Canada's commitment to CSR dates back to 1976 in accordance with the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. And since then, we've been engaged in the advancement of many international CSR guidelines and reporting standards. These include the UN guide, guiding principles on business and human rights, the Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights, and the Global Reporting Initiative. Now today I'd like to tell you a little bit about the four ways our government promotes CSR. Internationally, encouraging high labor standards, employment equity, and cooperative labor relations. The Government of Canada's approach to CSR covers all sectors and regions of the world where Canadian companies are present. We have an international CSR strategy focused on providing advice to Canadian companies and at the same time, we've been active in the areas of business and human rights in the ready-made garment sector. CSR is a priority for our government, not only because it contributes to the success of our co companies abroad, but because it fosters long-term sustainable development in countries and communities in which they operate. Internationally, Canada helps to promote corporate social responsibility through organizations like the OECD, the G7, and the International Labour Co-op organization. Through the ILO, Canada played a part in the development of international labor standards that enhance the protection of workers around the world, something that our labor program is extremely proud of, the role that we play in developing and maintaining, encouraging other countries to maintain and develop those standards. But let me be clear, CSR does not replace the obligations of businesses to respect the labor laws of the countries in which they're operating. Another example of how Canada strives to promote CSR is through our Trade Commissioner Services, which maintains an extensive network of offices and diplomatic missions. Here in India, we have more than 40 Trade Commissioners working at the Canadian High Commission in New Delhi and consulate missions such as in Mumbai, Bangalore, and Calcutta. Our Trade Commissioners work with the Canadian business community, national, state, and municipal governments, local communities, and civil society organizations to encourage responsible business practices that support sustainable economic development and shared values. For example, we recognize that fundamental labor rights are essential for the development of high labor standards, which are a conduit to productive workplaces, not an impediment. High labor standards help develop healthy, safe, and productive workplaces. When workers are at their best, productivity increases. 
And that's why Canadian law recognizes and provides for these high labor standards. I can't stress this strongly enough. We all have a responsibility to create opportunities for strong labor standards. We must be competitive in a global marketplace, but not at the expense of others, particularly of the workers who are focused on making sure that our companies, both Canadian companies, but those of other countries, are successful. Fairness at work is another element of our corporate social values. Everyone has the right to work in an environment that, where opportunities are based on skills and abilities and to not be discriminated against in their workplace. In Canada, our Employment Equity Act promotes equitable representation of women, Aboriginal Canadians, people with disabilities, and members of visible minorities in federally regulated workplaces. The Act helps employers identify and address workplace barriers by implementing fair practices and policies. Implemented in 1986, our government has worked with employers, provinces, and territories, as well as stakeholders to eliminate barriers to employment and to ensure that all Canadians have access to the exact same opportunities. But employment equity is more than a legal imperative. It simply makes good business sense. As was mentioned uh, earlier today by Prime Minister Modi, the issue of making sure diversity exists is extremely important. And eliminating discrimination means an opportunity to create diversity in the workplace that is more innovative and competitive. I am also the Minister of Status of Women in Canada, and one of my priorities is to highlight the key role women play in Canada's prosperity. In Canada, women represent nearly half of our Canadian workforce. When we create economic opportunities for women in Canada, we're helping our economy grow stronger. And we are encouraging other countries to do exactly the same. That diversity has been a huge asset to the Canadian economy. Recently, we've established an advisory committee on women entrepreneurs to provide a forum for the exchange of views and practices to help women entrepreneurs succeed, both within Canada and abroad. We've established an advisory committee to promote women on boards to increase women's representation at the corporate board level. And the business case for closing this gender gap is extremely strong. The evidence, when put forward, is that companies have an increase of ROI, which is something I'm sure this room understands, by 18% if you have two to three women on your board of 12 to 15. These are the numbers. As one good friend of mine who runs a large capital asset management firm says, I'm a mercenary. The reason I have women on my board is because I want to make money. <laughs> the point I want to make, though, is that increasing opportunities for underrepresented groups to participate in the labor market makes sense. And not just sense for CSR, it makes sense for your bottom line. Finally, our government strives to promote high corporate responsibility for Canadian businesses by fostering stable labor relationships. Respectfully and considerate treatment of workers pays dividends. It promotes trust, it encourages harmony between labor and management. Stable, stable labor relationships are essential for maintaining our reputation as a reliable trading partner, which is an important part for Canada as a trading nation. But I can emphasize to all of you here who are business leaders in the room, when I deal with employers and employees all across Canada, several of which are multinational companies, making sure that Canadian ports, railways, and all of our essential infrastructure have stability in their labor relations says to the rest of the world that we have a stable and growing economy. It adds to Canada's prosperity. And I would say to all of you that if you create that stable labor environment in your own countries, you will be attaining exactly the same goal, which means economic prosperity and more jobs. As Canada's Minister of Labor, my area of responsibility is the federal jurisdiction. We focus on large infrastructure and, quite frankly, simply getting products to market. Whether that be transportation is trucks, rail, airports, planes, trains, and automobiles, a work stoppage in our federal ju jurisdiction could disrupt our national commerce and product production, threaten business, and quite frankly, we'd suffer job losses. And that's why we have continued to encourage constructive conflict resolution by providing professional mediation services, something that in several budgets over the last number of years, we have augmented our services to Canadian companies in an effort to make sure employers and employees receive the mediation services they require 
so that we can actually have a productive working relationship on all the work sites in Canada. Over the last year, 97% of collective agreements within the federal jurisdiction were settled without a work stoppage. These and other measures taken by our government are helping Canadian businesses succeed globally while respecting our core values. And evidence shows that our approach is working. Many of Canada's top 50 socially responsible corporations are federally regulated, whether that be Bell Canada, TELUS, or the Bank of Montreal. Now, I've mentioned some of the ways that Canada promotes corporate social responsibility, which we believe are essential for a strong economy and sustainable development. But there is more work to be done, and we are eager to learn from other countries. And that's why we will continue to work with other domestic and foreign stakeholders at the community level as well as diplomatic levels to find new ways to promote responsible business practices. And with our international partners to protect fundamental rights of all individuals, in particular, as I mentioned earlier, vulnerable individuals, vulnerable workers, including women and children. So thank you very much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and I look forward to hearing from my other colleagues. I think there's a great deal that we can all learn from each other with respect to this f subject matter. I hope you have a lovely day. Thank you very much, ma'am. That was highly informative speech. We thank you again. We feel proud to have Sri Kumar Mangalam Birla with us. We are thankful to Sri Kumar Mangalam Birla for his August presence. I would request Mukesh Puri IAS to kindly welcome Kumar Mangalam Birla, sir, with the fruit basket. Thank you very much, sir, for being here. I would request all of you once again to put your phone on the silent mode as it is hampering our sound system. Thank you very much. With a prior apology, we would request dignitaries to restrict their address by 10 minutes. Taking the program further, I would like to warmly welcome and introduce Mr. Morgans Jensen, Honorable Minister of Trade and Investment, Government of Denmark. Having a strong parliamentary career, Mr. Jensen has always given a lot of priority towards society. His excellent leadership qualities and similar job profiles helped him to take up CSR very wisely. I would request him to address us with his views. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Namaste. Kim Cho. All well. Thank you very much. I'm very honored uh, to be here today and uh, to address this very important issue. And, and for me, it is really a very important issue, the CSR. And it cannot wonder why I've been working with the Trade Union Confederation in Denmark for more than uh, 18 years and uh, serving uh, some years as a sub steward. Then, of course, uh, CSR is uh, close to uh, one's heart. And uh, I had the luck of yesterday visiting the Gandhi Ashram, uh, not long from here. Um, and I also saw that, uh, that Gandhi was very much engaged with the unions of Gujarat, um, the textile unions, but also other unions. And he writes uh, somewhere two words, duty and rights. And those two words are also the words that the Danish society is built on. That everyone has a duty to uh, his or her country, to his workplace, his company, but you also have rights. And the balance between duty and rights is what carries uh, your forward and I think that's also a, a core learning about uh, CSR, that it is also a balance of duty and uh, rights. And because the duty and rights is a part of the Danish model, a model where we work on a tripart system, having the companies, the employers association working together with unions and governments on how to create a sustainable uh, production where you of course respect decent working conditions, you try to involve labor in uh, production and you also take the necessary uh, environmental protection into to mind. 
these are very, very, very core and very uh, important uh, words and also goals in the efforts that the Danish government is uh, putting forward in order uh, to raise awareness on CSR and to practice uh, CSR. Last year, uh, we decided in the government to launch a new prize called CSR Abroad. And this prize is awarded to Danish companies that make a special effort to demonstrate corporate social responsibility in developing countries and in emerging markets. Uh, the CSR Abroad was launched in cooperation with uh, the Danish Investment Fund for Developing Countries. And I think it's very important to say that the Danish approach to CSR is, of course, focused on the company itself. It's about high social and environmental standards for the company. It's about health and safety in the workplace. And it is also about anti-corruption. Recently, inspired by the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, respect for human rights throughout the value chain now has been added. In September this year, I put forward on behalf of the Danish government our own plan for CSR and responsible supply chains, what we call decent work responsible uh, production, which can be found on our homepage. But moving on to the predominant approach in India, I know that you have in India a strong tradition for philanthropy, which is deeply rooted in your culture. The New Companies Act from 2013 is very important development in harmony with this tradition. Philanthropy can be just philanthropy, but it can also be strategic CSR. India and the Confederation of Indian Industries seem to be very much aware of this as reflected in its recent guidance to Indian enterprises called Handbook on Corporate Social Responsibility in India. The point being that if you do them right, as part of an overall CSR strategy based on your business strategy and shared values, activities for social and economic development in the community will give you many advantages. First, they give you a license to operate. Secondly, they enhance the loyalty of employees. And thirdly, they strengthen the reputation of the company. Sooner or later, they will also grow your business. And this is where I believe that European companies have much to learn from their Indian partners and competitors. Your understanding of the importance of the community as a stakeholder for the company is more and vast than ours in many ways. And on that background, it is no coincidence that out of three Danish companies that were nominated for the first CSR broad prize, two of them, Danfoss and LM Wind Power, were subsidiaries from India. And that is indeed a cadeau to all those of you who are working with the CSR here in India. Naranya Murthy, the Chairman Emeritus of Infosys, said last year, the battle for inclusive growth must be fought collectively with all our resources and in partnership. And let me add to that, for the sake of the bottom line and also for the sake of our shared future. Thank you very much, Appa. I'm looking forward to our discussions today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jensen, for Danish role model of CSR before us. We appreciate it. As Sri Mangubai Patel, our Honorable Minister, has to leave for signing of an MOU, we are thankful for his gracious presence over here. And a round of applause for Minister Sri.
With heartfelt pride and also a lot of pleasure, I would like to welcome and introduce Mrs. Rajashree Birla, Chairperson Aditya Birla Foundation. Director on the board of all the major Aditya Birla group of companies has always given utmost priority to the CSR through n number of activities like institutions associated with FIKI and many others. She has been awarded with many priceless and prestigious awards and recognition for her CSR activities. We welcome you, ma'am. Over to you, ma'am. Honorable Union Minister of Finance, Corporate Affairs, Shri Arun Jaitley, Shri Saurabh Patel, the Gujarat FM, and distinguished members on the dais, ladies and gentlemen. I am indeed delighted to be with all of you this afternoon as part of the vibrant Gujarat Summit. It augurs well that at this summit, the focus is also on CSR through this seminar. I have been asked to talk about the way forward in the changing CSR paradigm. I would like to draw upon the vision, the foresight, and the wisdom of our Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi. In this regard, let me recount his address on our 68th Independence Day. Spoken from head and heart, it was totally electrifying. Independence Day is an occasion to take a pledge for the welfare of all those who are downtrodden, poor, exploited, and oppressed, and to do something for them, our Sri Modi. And the anguish in his voice was palpable. He spoke with the fervor of a possessed social reformer and very clearly established a connect with tens of millions of our fellow countrymen, striking a chord in every Indian. The vision and relevance of the PM speech is more pronounced in today's age when so many of us are committed to a new India. We despair over the fact that after nearly seven decades of freedom, our country is not yet free from the yoke of poverty. The Prime Minister has sent out a clear message. His vision is to bring in an India of inclusive growth, an India where every person realizes his or her optimal potential, and India where, where every human being lives a life of dignity. The way forward has been spelled out in the, the PM, setting the agenda. Through the government's pro proactive steps, a slew of initiatives have been launched to alleviate poverty. These encompass critical areas such as skill development, education, health, sanitation, and development. The financial inclusion scheme, Pradhan Mantri Jandhan Yojana, and the Swachh Bharat Abhyan to improve sanitation and encourage cleanliness standards are a testament to the intent. I am pleased to inform you that we in the Aditya Birla group are totally committed to the Swachh Bharat Abhyan. We are engaged with 2,500 villages through our group companies and we reach out to around 7 million people. Under the aegis of the Aditya Birla Center for Community Initiatives and Rural Development, we will be building 10,000 toilets. In the last three years, we have built around 7,000 toilets. We are investing a lot of time and effort in creating awareness and focusing on the importance of hygiene. The Prime Minister has said there should be a toilet in every home by 2019. All of us must pay serious heed to this issue and earmark funds and numbers to take this forward. The engagement of more and more corporates in the CSI domain with the new company law is now a given. Paying attention to development processes through a holistic approach is the way forward. This entails a razor-sharp focus on education, health, sustainable livelihood, and infrastructure. Even as we in the Altabilla group are following this very integrated model, the state of Gujarat provides a fine example for the CSR trajectory. Let me add that under Shri Modi's dynamic leadership as CM of Gujarat, 
over 15 years, the government of Gujarat succeeded in in taking inclusive growth to a different level. It is among the most pr prosperous states in the country. I believe that Gujarat offers a lot of lessons. The state has addressed basic issues and helped people move forward by their accessibility to the basics, such as health, education, water, electricity, sanitation, and transportation. Take health and education. The infant mortality rate was brought down from 60 in 2001 to 38 in 2012. Over the same period, the number of universities increased from 15 to 52, while the number of government colleges rose from 20 to 71. Most commendable was a sharp fall over the decade in the school dropout rates of students from Standard 1 to Standard 5, from 20.5% to 2.1%. What is the lifetime of existence? In this regard, Gujarat has made significant strides in addressing its water problems through rainwater harvesting, check dams, and interbasin transfers. Twenty rivers have been interlinked, thereby helping to alleviate the problem of uneven distribution of water. These projects have helped raise people from the below the poverty line to above the poverty line, so much so that the state's poverty ratio is among the lowest in the country. There is much to learn from Gujarat's story. There are two more points that I would want to share with you on the way forward in the changing CSR paradigm. The first is about training vocational training, educational processes that will help us leverage our demographic dividend. Populations in economies like Europe and Japan have begun to age. It is projected that India in 2050 will have the largest number of young below 25 years in the world at 550 million and the largest number of people in the productive age group of 20 to 60 years, 800 million. I believe labor shortages in the developed countries will continue to drive the flow and labor intensive services to countries like India. At the same time, India will be in a position to place our talent in these countries. So our priority should be to orient our training towards this need. My second and the last point, again, relates to the PM's Independence Day speech, wherein he said, and I quote him, each of our MPs should make one village of his or her constituency a model village. This is particularly encouraging, as to build a nation, we have to secure the foundation of our villages. Gandhiji always said that India lives in its villages. We firmly believe that this is the way forward for maximizing the social impact of CSR projects. Very humbly, I would like to state that this, this was one of our path breaking CSR initiatives in our group began more than a decade ago. We evolved the concept of model villages, giving it a definite shape. Making of village model entails ensuring self-reliance in all aspects with education, healthcare, and family welfare, infrastructure, agriculture, and watershed management, and working towards sustainable livelihood patterns. Basically in the villages which we adopted, more than 80% of the people were living below the poverty line. Our objective to make a paradigm shift and over a five-year time frame, lift 90% of those living below the poverty line and make them economically self-reliant. Up until now, we have transformed 70 villages into model villages of the 300 villages that we have adopted. So every corporate must think of adopting villages for transformation into model villages. Let me conclude again on a thought voiced by the PM. He said, and I quote him, just imagine if 125 crores of our countrymen take a step forward the country will move 125 crores steps forward. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for the highly motivational and foresighted speech.
Your keen interest in taking the underprivileged along in growth is evident in your address. We are highly grateful to you for that. We would like all of you to take a small note that the fruit baskets presented to the dignitaries would be handed over to the Anganwadi ladies for the Anganwadi kids. And by accepting the concept of fruit baskets, we say no to flowers and contribute to our corporate social responsibility because we believe practice before you preach. A round of applause for this thought of our government. This shows charity begins at home. Thank you, dignitaries. With due respect and pride, I would welcome and introduce our Honorable Union Minister for Finance and Corporate Affairs, Government of India, Sri Arun Jaitley, sir. Sri Arun Jaitley, sir, is having a strong political career, and during this, he has handled most crucial portfolios. With his guidance and foresight, he has taken India to newer heights on world platform. I would now humbly request Sri Arun Jaitley, sir, to do the release of a monograph on the proceedings of the National Conference on Financial Inclusion held on 9th December 2014 as part of the vibrant Gujarat events. Please on, sir, do the honors, sir. I need a bigger round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, please, um, you share your views regarding the vision on the CSR. Over to you. <laughs> 